seeing this for the first time was amazing. Just seeing this is just... I think we're fortunate that this sculpture has been purchased by Greg Omer and it ended up in the collection. It was collected at Sherberg Aboriginal community. It was obviously easy to compare it to two similar sculptures that are in the Queensland Museum that were donated in the mid-1990s um, by Betty McKenzie. And these two sculptures were made in Sherberg in the early 1930s by Fred Embry. And the process of him making them um, is well documented. And, and then they ended up in the collection of Betty's parents, who were the superintendent and matron in charge of Sherberg Aboriginal community. So these two other sculptures, Betty, Betty was living in Sherberg, I guess only a young, young child, when they were made in, in about 1933. So, so those ones are well documented. This one, is so similar to them, so there's no doubt that Fred Embry made them. So I was fortunate to know <coughs> the granddaughter of Fred Embry who made this sculpture, um, Penny, or P Penny Embry or Penny Bond, who was later known as. She remembers her grandfather. She, she grew up with him um, after the death of her father, Dennis. Yeah, she knew Fred well, so she, she, would, she would have known all about the importance of these sculptures, and she's passed that knowledge on to her children. You know, this is part of their history, something that they've grown up with all their lives, knowing about how important their great-grandfather was and knowing about the skills and that, that he made sculptures like this. I know the others, I've known about these carvings. My mum told me since I was young, as far back as I can remember, four or five, about these carvings. She told me the crawberries, she told me about how great-grandfather went out and. One day when he was travelling, he came across um, bunya nuts and how he went to get all of them and then the Junjidi, well, threw a nut at him and hit him on the shoulder. The great-grandfather looked around and couldn't see the, the Junjidi. Then another one hit him on the head, then he looked up and the Junjidi told him, leave some for other people. But only take what you need for yourself and your wife. That's the story that my mum told me about these Junjadis and this carving, and that's as far back as I can remember. Uh, Great-grandfather made a crawberry up about it, so when he brought it back to Sherberg after he carved them, he did a special ceremony where he played, he danced that song and sang that song about the Junjadis and that incident to let and teach other people around and the, about the culture of sharing. And this is very important, that's what, to me, this, these Junjadis represent that way as they taught us lessons. And so growing up, knowing about these, and then first seeing this one's like amazing. It's a really important conduit, if I want to put it that way, for people to understand more about us. Uh, it's just an amazing journey. This has been an amazing journey for this one. There have been, there are two other carvings not so looked after. This one's in well, far better condition and represents our culture, I suppose, you know, represents part of our culture and a very important part. When I first heard about the objects being returned, it was um, pretty exciting, but also there's a lot of mixed emotions around it. Like, well, how did we not know there were more than two? You know, where did this one appear from? Uh, all kinds of questions came. Um, some of it, sort of around sadness, around the realisation this is like colonial conquest, um, you know, the colonial arm, but also there's also this big happiness about reconciliation, that this is a form of reconciliation. Um, I'm Sylvia. I was named after Fred Embry's wife, Sylvia Cabo Walker and Fred Embry is Cubby. I belong to the Jala clan group. Fred is my mother's father's father. I had direct knowledge from my mother about Fred Embry 
who she referred to as Grandfather Warden, mainly because she grew up with Grandfather Warden until she was no longer able to be in the community, reared up in a family and was taken into the dormitory system. Mum had good knowledge of grandfather's history and also of great-grandfather's culture and the way he fitted into our song line. He taught my mother our song line. I was aware that the first two sculptures that he created were taken to the museum for safety by Betty McKenzie and family. I also do know that great-grandfather spent a lot of time with Betty McKenzie and her family. I've recently found out about a third sculpture and I'm very excited about it because I have been to the museum on a number of occasions, firstly by myself and also with excursions from school with the school children and we've seen the Junjadis. Um, I visited them, I've been able to hold them and um, now with this third one, I'm even more excited. I firmly believe that those Junjadis are the statues of the family. I believe that one is of Warden himself, the second one of Sylvia, and the third one would be of Denny Embry, the son. Denny died in 1934 at an early age. He uh, caught pneumonia and was very sick. So um, my mother was left with Fred Embry. It was passed down to me through family that these drunkenies were carved in the Manambar scrub and that Manambar was of very high spiritual significance to our family and also to the Cubby people and the Jala clan group. Kilkeven, Manumbar, Waluga, all that area were associated with great-grandfather Wyden. It was very significant and of high importance that he carved them in that area. Great-grandfather has created a legacy by leaving all this evidence and all this very important information behind for us to share and also to acknowledge the country of where we belong. It's been very important in the way we deal with our native title and also our song line and our story line. I feel blessed in a way. I didn't understand what my mum was, you know, why she was telling me all these stories. They were very interesting, exciting stories, but now I understand. I understand why she's telling me the stories now. Now that I'm old, or older, I actually understand the importance of what it all was. And um, yeah, it's a really great thing. And this is what it all brings back to me. And this old man, old Gabba, he had an obligation. He had an obligation and responsibility that he could not walk away from. So he carved these things. He made corroborees and dances. So we can sing them. That's what he did, on purpose, consciously, you know? So. Yeah, good on him. Uh, like, to the scientists, these creatures don't exist. To the scientists, they never existed. But to us, they exist. And to us, they've been here for a long time. And to, they've been here before us. There would have been a headdress, a headdress with emu feathers as well. Would probably possum skin uh, headdress. It would have been similar to my great-grandfather's headdress, much the same. And there's, there's photos of his headdress. Fred Embry's way of maintaining culture and uh, keeping our culture alive in his grandchildren and his nephews and his nieces was uh, he must have had such great foresight, like even to get, to tell Elizabeth Mackenzie the stories and to write down words of songs for her so she would keep it so that, you know, his future generations would have access you know, Gurri Nanami is one of the most used songs in Queensland and everybody wants to claim it. And there's so many people say, oh, that comes, my, we, that comes from our place. But, you know, unless you understand what the words are, you can't interpret, it wouldn't be interpreted into, you know, Gamilaroi language or Gurang, Gurang language or, you know, Kalkadoon language, you wouldn't, you wouldn't be able to interpret it. It can only be sung through cubby words. And because Betty Semple wrote, you know, it's written in there, 
handwriting in Fred's handwriting the words, what it means. So it can't be disputed. Yeah, well, it's good that the um, Queensland Gallery of Modern Art have decided that they would purchase this piece and that they're going that little bit further than just purchasing it and actually straight away putting it on display or organising some extraordinary exhibition for people to go and ogle what, what's on display. It's more that this time they've taken the time to find out who created the piece. It's the way that reconciliation occurs. You know, Mum was very big on reconciliation and how we work together. We have a shared history. Those art pieces have a shared history and um, it's how things can move forward together. There's no doubt, it's got our country in it. It'll have our ochres. It'll have our feathers, it'll have our string, it'll have our, you know, that come from our country. Yeah, well, Goma's would be the best place for it to be right now. You know, uh, we have no facilities or no, no, no places where we could keep a precious thing like this. It's also important for uh, Goma being a central point for culture in the of Queensland. It's, I think it's important that it can represent us here at Goma and represent our, our culture anyway. And, and our stories about the Jamjini or Dangana Lakwe. Great-grandfather obviously had foresight because he was able to make it possible for us to sit here today and have evidence of where we come from and who we are and give us identity. We've always had identity and I'm very thankful for that. Because these are not just items. These are part of our family. That's all I can do today.